Hey everyone. everyone, two quick reminders before we start this next episode. We're still accepting applications for the Black Student Success Scholarship until April 30th. And our fundraiser for our new online community to connect Black students and professionals ends this Friday, April 16th. So if you want to donate to the cause or apply to the scholarship, both links are in the description. Okay, okay, let's get into the podcast. Enjoy everyone. And probably one of the first movies that you probably see where, where there's black excellence in the beginning of the movie if you think about it that's fair that's fair i i i agree with that 100 percent. yeah so yeah so. i can't think of you right i can't think of no other movie before that that had that that's right yeah because <laughs> yeah even think of a bet movie is always like well you're wondering how i got here <laughs> <laughs> Get chased name, by a dog my, or something. Look, right? my, my name is Jerome. I bet you I wonder how I got to this point in my day. Let me take y'all back to see. You're right. <laughs> Opening credits. Let's go. <laughs> What's going on, everybody? Thanks for joining us for another episode of the Black Student Success Podcast, where we bring you insight and guidance from successful Black professionals. My name is Selvin, and of course, we appreciate the support. So today we have Marquise Williams on the show. He is an experienced chef who's going to talk about his experiences. He's done um, a lot, both uh, kind of working for a company, doing things for himself. And so he's going to give us both sides of the coin and all the things that he's done to kind of get to the point where he's at now. So Marquise, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I appreciate that, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you for, for joining. So we're going to start the show how we always do by asking you the question, who is Marquise Williams? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I'm a man. I'm a father. Uh, I'm a provider. I am a chef. I am the most introverted extrovert you've probably ever met. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta love the introverted extroverts or or the, yeah. the way you flip it, man. That that's what that's what's up. Um perfect, perfect. So uh so let's kind of start from the beginning. You know, what was your childhood like? What was your family makeup like? What were some of those things uh as you were growing up that had impact that built you into the person today? Um man, I, I got it out the mud pretty much. I grew up in the hood. Um I was raised with my grandmother, primarily my mother was in the army. Uh, father figure wasn't around. Um, so I was raised by women, man. My grandmother, my mother, my great grandmother. Those were my uh, instilling factors in making me the man that I am today. Um, from cooking to how I treat women to how I take care of my daughter. Um, they were the molding of me. They are me and I am them. So um, you know, growing up was pretty smooth for the most part, um, very strict. Um, I was very bad. I had, a, I had a temper. Um, I fought a lot, but I got good grades. I had A's and B's, but I fought a lot. So go figure. Um, my grandmother was pretty strict on me most of the time. You know, I always had to clean. You know, I do the normal chores. Um, my great grandmother owned a dry cleaners and we grew up under her roof. So I had to learn how to do laundry at a young age, how to iron, how to, you know, clean, cook. I, I was in the kitchen. I can remember even as early as maybe three or four, just watching my great grandma cook. And that was probably what started me having an interest in cooking because I was always in the kitchen. I was always watching what they were doing. I was always looking to bowl from the cake mixes, um, you know, just, being in that environment, it, it's a comfort for me. That's I think that's probably why I, I wanted to go into the culinary field when I chose to. Yeah, yeah it's that's uh it's interesting how some of those feelings, you know, those moments that you remember from your childhood that don't even have to do with the actual cooking itself, but kind of bring those, um, like you said, moments of comfort and, you know, uh, some of the reasons why you actually kind of started getting into that. Um, where's the, where, where did you start the cooking um, kind of, you know, on your own um, kind of during that time or did that happen sometime in college or when did that actually begin for you? You know, I did it here and there, but it wasn't really until college that it, it, it kind of came out fully. Um, I cooked in the dorms a lot, and I would cook for my football teammates, 
and they can attest, you know what I'm saying? Even like some, even just people that weren't even on the football team, a lot of people that lived in the dorms when I was at Concordia can vouch. Like whenever I cooked, it was a thing, you know what I'm saying? Like it, that's where I think it started that I knew I had a gift that I could give to the world. I guess you can say, I, I probably didn't want to give it to the world fully at that time, but it was something that I liked to do. It was, it made me happy, you know, being able to make people happy with something that I did. It, it made me feel good. And uh, that's where my potential, I think, excelled the most. Um, so, but well, keep in mind, I'm, I guess I'm probably getting ahead of myself, but I went to school to, to be a criminal justice major and a psychology minor. I ended up graduating with a double double bachelor's in criminal justice and psychology and then decided I didn't want to go to law school because, one, I missed the deadline of the school I wanted to go to by maybe three minutes. Mm. Now, mind you, I got in about four other law schools, but I didn't I wasn't ready. I didn't feel like I was ready. Plus, I didn't want to go out of state. Um, and I wanted to go to the University of Wisconsin, Madison. So I missed that deadline by literally three minutes because of the Eastern Standard time frame. And I didn't pay attention to the application. So it was all my fault. But when I did get ready to submit it, the computer froze. Mm. So killed me. Hurt my heart. So <laughs> right. So after that, I was just like, you know what? This is a sign. God, not ready for me to, to go to law school. I'm not mentally ready for that workload. So I said, well, I still can go to school for free because my mother was in the army. So I have maybe two or three more years more, year, yeah. two or three more years left of free schooling that I could get after I got my, my bachelor's. I said, why not just go to culinary school and have something as a backup plan? And now, mind you, at that point, I already knew how to cook, you know, from what I was taught as a child on up. But for me to go to culinary school was more so of a strategic move to make sure that I had the proper training and techniques on what was needed in the world to get where I needed to be. If I wanted to, whether I wanted to be in a hotel chain, be an executive sous chef, certain places. Um, I mean, an executive sous chef of a corporation can make upwards of like 80 to 130,000 a year. So the money is there if you're good at what you do. So to have the credentials only puts a better backing on me when I'm submitting my resume on top of my bachelor's on top of when it comes time to, when it can't, well, when it comes time to get my food truck, I have all of these credentials on top of my education, which furthermore presents success, a higher success rate when I go to get a loan for a business loan to get my food truck and things like that. So it's more of a strategic move of a means to an end. So that's where we are with that. Yeah. 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 I think, um, it's, uh, you know, when you have the experience where you feel like you're, you, you can do the job itself because you've grown up, you've learned all these things along the way, um, it's perfect segue to kind of, you know, getting that realization of the kind of the why that you went and why you went to, to culinary school because you can cook, you've, you've already, you've already had these years of experience and you spoke to just having the credential and the, and the proper training now you went into that situation kind of with that mindset. And now, you know, after the fact, could you say that, you know, those, those thoughts that you had before you went to culinary school, did those match up with the reality of, you know, having the, the culinary degree? No, um, because going into culinary school, all I had at that point was Hell's Kitchen and, and, you know, TV shows. So I, I had no idea what I was getting myself into with culinary school. Um, the first maybe half of culinary school is a lot of classroom stuff. You know, you got to take your, your, your math, uh, food measurements classes. You got to take um, culinary 101 and 102. You're in class for two or three hours just in the classroom. Then the other two and a half hours, you're in the lab, in, the, in a practical lab, it, uh, practicing what you just learned. So I can remember my first, my first, our first lesson was egg cookery. That's pretty much practical culinary 101 stuff. Start with, you learn how to cook eggs. Now, you know, I, I was, I like scrambled eggs. I thought I was pretty good at finesse and scrambled eggs. I was all wrong. You know, I had to forget everything I thought I knew in order to learn things the proper way. At that point, then I can tweak it the way I need to, to make it my own. But it was going into culinary school is more so I had to mentally learn and be told by my chefs 
forget everything you think, you know, this is how you need to do it. And I took that with me through my culinary career. And even in life, you know, if I have, if ever I've started a new job since that point, it's always don't come in thinking, you know, everything, mm. you know, forget everything, you know, learn the way that they want, that they want you to do it. And then if you can make it your own, do that. Never come in thinking, you know, everything because you'll get shut down and humbled real quick. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think that's that's actually really dope advice. Um, and like you said, it could be applied to anything, you know, kind of going in there with with an open mind and ready to learn and and, you know, compare compare what you're learning in that classroom kind of uh, to the experiences that you had outside of that. Um, and, you know, if you if you had that advice or was able to give that advice to some students, you know, whether they're, you know, uh, you know, they did an internship and then they feel like they learned everything and then they're not going to a job and they're, um, you know, kind of seeing exactly what that is. Um, you know, what advice would you give them to, to kind of take on that, that type of thought process early on? <laughs> I, it's hard because I see both ends because I've worked with people that have had no classic culinary training. I've never went to culinary school, but they are awesome chefs. Um, but they still can have some growth and the, that growth could have come from going to culinary school. But a lot of people don't have the means, don't have, you know, what it takes to go to culinary school or what, what they need to go to culinary school. And that's fine. Um, if a person is going to take on that endeavor, I would say go in with the open mind, go in with the humble spirit and an openness to learn everything you need to learn to be great because, Literally everything I've learned, not only I cannot take with me in the culinary world, but I can apply it to my to social life. I can apply it to any other job because of the the ambition, the skill set, the not necessarily skill set, but the uh, what am I trying to say? The mindset that you're given and have to 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 follow in being uh adhering to schedules adhering to time frames things like that it's not it doesn't just apply in the kitchen it, it applies in real life i mean that's that's what i can sum, summarize it up as just making sure that you have an open mind and that you're humble because you will get humble if you're not <laughs> there you, <laughs> you go you can get humble real quick oh of course <laughs> we know that for sure so now getting into since you've had the experience of, you know, kind of doing, you know, the, the cooking in a kitchen, um, you know, for a restaurant or an establishment and, you know, having the opportunity to do some type of catering, what differences can you pull from being in those two types of environments, um, especially if somebody is looking to or maybe they have this idea, I want to work in a kitchen. I know that's what I want to do or I know that I want to get into catering. Um what is it like being in those two environments just so that, you know, everybody has a good perspective as they're kind of trying to figure out where they want to end up? Working in the kitchen, you're, you're fast paced, high quantity, high quality, consistent production all the time. You're held to a higher level when you're put on a, on a, if you're put on saute, if you're put on, uh, on, on, on cold station, if you're put on, Whatever station you're put on, you need to be the master of that. You need to have and what we're taught, you know, in IOTA, proper preparation. You have to be properly prepared for everything. You have to have your you have to have your backup uh, products. You have to have everything already fully stocked. You have to be ready to go. You got to be able to, to adjust accordingly. And you got to be ready for the rushes. The dinner rushes, lunch rushes are no joke. Um, catering, on, on the other hand, is not as... Uh, aggressive. Um, with catering, you can go at your own pace because you can plan things out accordingly on how you want to do things and in, in the priority of which it needs to get done. I mean, you can do the same in the kitchen too, but with catering, it's a little bit more or less uh, crunch time. You know what I'm saying? Unless you put yourself in that position to have to have that crunch time. Mm -hmm. Me, I'm a good planner, so I try to plan things out where I'm ready to go and doing multiple things at once. You got to be able to multitask on both both sides of the game. Um, and all, like I said, on both sides, you also want to be prepared in all aspects. And you got to have backup plans. Um, but making sure that, one, you're properly prepared. Two, that 
you have back, you know, have a backup plan to a backup plan. And three, that you can adjust to anything, you you can pretty much be successful. Um, and, and just make sure you stay consistent as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like it's just really a, a difference of pace. So if it you, is definitely if you really like the, you know, go, 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 let's like knock this out, do really well, move on to the next thing. That's, you know, that kind of that would be your your environment, that kitchen environment. But um, I know there's a, a different set of people who like to, you know, like you said, take the time, uh, you know, put these plans together in terms of, you know, the the, the food amounts, you know, what's going to be in it, you know, that the people that you're serving. Um, I can understand that there's more of, you know, keeping an idea of the the people that you're serving when it comes to the catering and how you want to form that when it comes to the planning. Would you say that? Yeah. And definitely with catering, you, you're you OK. So with a kitchen, you're more stuck to working with the menu that the restaurant or hotel has with catering, especially if you're doing your own thing. Me, I'm the type of caterer where one, I work with your budget. I try to give you the most bang for your buck. People often ask, well, where's your catering menu? I don't have one. Why? Because you tell me what, you, what you're what you trying to do. You tell me what your budget is. And I can tell you what we can accommodate with that. I don't I don't feel I need a, a, a menu to be able to accommodate my customers. And I never have had one. And I've been able to be successful at every single one of my catering events without that. And the customers that I, that I, that I get, the customers that have, you know, passed me off on word of mouth, they know that. I can give them whatever they want and as long as I and I can work within their budget. You know, and I'm and I give realistic expectations. That's also a big thing. You don't want to give false hope to people. You know, if someone comes to you, oh, I got 25 people and I'm only working with a thousand dollars, that's not gonna get you much. You gotta be realistic, realistic with that. So are you trying to feed them or are you trying to give them a snack? That that, that we can work with because if you're not gonna you're not gonna feed uh 25 people for a thousand dollars, you know what I'm saying? It's just not gonna work. Yeah. Um, but you can give them a snack. We can do appetizers. That's reasonable. You know what I'm saying? Because you also have to factor in my labor. We're talking about food plus labor costs. Um, and that's, again, where the math comes in. You you got to be able to know what you're worth and be able to add tax to that, as people would say. Um, at first, I think I was undervaluing myself in this game because I wanted clientele and I wanted to build my clientele. But as I got better and as I got stronger in my skill level and and, and production and what I can do, I realized I'm going to get what I deserve. And everybody should be able to get what they deserve. If you're that good, get what you're worth. Don't ever let nobody shortchange you at all in any capacity, in any field you're in, but more so culinary arts. Yeah. Yeah. There's um, and I feel like you can only. You know, maybe unless you had, you know, some type of, um, you know, course in terms of kind of valuing yourself, which you may or may not have seen, but I'm, I'm sure the experience is kind of what helps you develop. Okay, this is this is everything I went to go, you know, that I went through for that first catering event that I went, uh, that I did. And okay, this is how these things could be better. This is how I can, you know, uh, be more efficient with the, the budget that was provided to me. All right, cool. Now I can put kind of those skills to, to, to paper and say, okay, now this is kind of what I'm worth knowing that I can do this job a lot better, you know, than the last time. So, the, so that's, that's good that you pointed out um, the, the knowing your work piece, because there's a lot of work that goes into that. Um, you know, there's, you know, representation of you as a, as a chef. And then, um, you know, for the, the client that you're working with, whoever they're serving in terms of the food. So um, I'm sure that that's a lot of stuff that you have to keep in mind when you're putting those things together. Definitely. definitely. Absolutely. Cool. So um, one of the things I wanted to point out, because, you know, you have this uh, this entrepreneurial uh, mindset and you kind of went into a direction of, you know, putting your own beer products together. Now, I was yeah. curious just to kind of know um, if any of the things that you learned, you know, um, as a culinary student kind of factored into when you're creating the products and when you're, you know, keeping the, the customer in customer in mind and the, you know, the different um, elements of the ingredients that you're using to create, you know, whatever product that you're, you know, putting out there. Well, yeah, just to give a little, can I give a little background on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So Bearded Pharaoh, 
was something that I came up with after going through so many different beer products. I mean, you, you know, I have a, I have a deuce of beer. I've had one since I was maybe 13. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I've, I've got a lot of experience with beers. So needless to say, after going through so many products, I, I, I didn't, I found that there wasn't a, there was a lot of BS in the ingredients of which we get these products that men get these products. Mm -hmm. So I decided, you know what, I can make this stuff all naturally with less chemicals and all of that stuff. So all of my products are all natural handmade, um, beard products and body care products from my from my beard butters to my body butters to my body scrubs to my lip scrubs for the ladies um like i have a whole line that people if only people would know if they actually looked at my page because i don't market it I, I go by word of mouth which i probably again should value myself a little bit more in this aspect with that because i should put myself out there more with it but i've had a good decent outcome with word of mouth because of my products um, but nonetheless, yes, I have applied my culinary skills with that and, and one in how to whip the butter, <laughs> mm. so to speak, because those, some, those are some things you learn in culinary arts, how to, how to make butter from scratch. Well, it's the same application when whipping shea butter, and cocoa butter, learning how to get the melting points, the proper melting points so you won't scold it, so it won't come out smelling burnt, how to, you know, figuring out what scents is, is just as equal to figuring out what tastes go together. So making sure that I'm using both sets of skills to make my products that much greater. Yeah, man, it definitely goes hand in hand because if I didn't have my culinary skills, my products probably wouldn't be as good as they were. You know, it was trial and error for it. It took me a good maybe two months before I launched my products to figure out the, pre the precise measurements, the, what worked. I literally was writing down everything, what failed, what worked, the different scents that would work together. Man, I mean, yeah, my culinary skills definitely helped in, in being able to be successful with my beer products. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so and and, and it's um it's cool when you can combine those two things. Um, and especially for something that you've kind of you know uh, worked with personally. You know, you know, having having the beer since you know those teen years and, and trying to figure out what would work well. And it's like. You know, I got all this know-how. I got this knowledge. Um, I can put these skills to work and make something not only good for myself, but for other people as well, which um, it sounds like it kind of goes back to that whole mantra of being able to serve people, um, being able to share those skills, you know, with the world and with the, you know, the people that are around you. Um, one point that I actually wanted to kind of touch on, it, especially when it came to the, the marketing sense, because you've had so much success through word of mouth, um, what um, do you feel like there's something that you intentionally do to have so much success with word of mouth um, in, in terms of the experiences that you're creating? Um, you know, if, are there some gems that you may have learned along the way that you could pass along to some of our audience members who might want to get into some type of, um, you know, entrepreneurial skills or, or um, ventures where they're kind of serving people? Definitely. Um, one, I would say that the success of black businesses thrives on one, not on one, but very one very important factor is important in the success of black businesses, and that's customer service. You know, and in, in, in my in bringing my businesses to the to the table, I made sure that I give the best quality customer service that I can in dealing with everybody, no matter what. If it's a small question to people placing actually orders, you know. And, and that came from the lack of customer service experiences that I've had with a lot of black businesses. You know, the number one issue that I have with a lot of places that you go to a black business and they'll have their time, their, their hours posted in their clothes during those time frames. You can't get in contact with them. You get no response back or you get rude responses. These are things that I've learned from experience and dealing with that I said, I'm not going to do in my business because I want my business to be successful. So being able to have that rapport being able to be confident in your products and what you're doing and knowing that you can provide that quality customer service that's going to keep that person coming back or is going to tell someone, oh my God, he gave such good quality service and his products are good. That that I'll take that over marketing and, and anything else because if I'm putting something on social media, those people are going to share it who's going to share it to somebody else who's going to share it to somebody else. 
in, in reality, social media is our new marketing platform mm-hmm. in my in my perspective. And it's free. I don't have to waste money on that. I could, but I don't. I don't have to. I'm saving money by being able to provide that good quality customer service. And that's going to spread me a hundredfold because just because of that alone, because it's something that they didn't, they might not have gotten with somebody else. I've had people come to me Well, I dealt with this person or I dealt with another company. Please don't do this. Or, you know, can you, what can you do for me? And then I, t- I take it, I break them down. I, I hook them up. And next thing you know, I got six other clients calling me about stuff. Yeah. So it, it matters. Customer service matters. And that's probably the, the biggest factor I feel in my success and, and also the failures of other, some other black businesses, because, you're not you're not holding yourself accountable and you're not being consistent with your customer service. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Start off, or you start off good and then you go down a slippery slope. <laughs> yeah. So the, the the connection with people and 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 realizing treating everybody kind of like the you know, like a customer. I think even if you're, you know, um uh, you know, a recent graduate or maybe kind of have a, a job where you're actually dealing with people, even if it's like, you know, fast food, for example, you know, that's still an aspect of customer service that you can pick up a lot of good things. Um, it's, it's everywhere. And then, you know, you being able to take experiences that you've had and flip those for, you know, your own business and to serve others um, is definitely a powerful thing that when, once you can put all those things together. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So now with all these things that you've done, you know, you've, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, experience, uh, uh, just being a really experienced cook, um, you know, businessman, all of the things that you kind of put together. And maybe these are things that you have already attained in terms of what you define your success to be. But uh, what is your definition of success? And, um, you know, what types of things are you kind of doing to attain those or have attained them? I don't feel I'm successful yet. I've, I've, I've achieved some things. But uh, I definitely have a long ways to go. I'm always about improving myself and becoming better. Um, but what do I define as success, man? Consistency. Consistency and, and the, the, the desire and willingness to want to be better and do better and grow daily. You can't remain stagnant. You can't be complacent in where you're at. You have to want to be better. You have to have it in you. It's not, it can't be something that, that you aspire to do. You have to want to do it. You have to have the drive. You have to have that fundamental motivation inside you that says, I'm going to do this. I can reach this goal. You have to have your goals. I'm learning now to write my goals down instead of keeping them in my head because it just doesn't, it doesn't get me anywhere by keeping it in my head. If I'm writing it down and I'm checking it off my list, that's success because I've did everything it took to get to that goal. And then I'm okay, let's go to the next thing. What's next. It's all about what's next. Not okay. I'm good. You're never good. You can always be better. We know that. <laughs> <laughs> There's always, always, there's always room for improvement. So having, so having that, that drive and not uh, settling for contentment, that's what you define as, as success, being able to kind of keep those things going. Yeah, money is always good, but money come and go. You know, if I'm, if I know that what I'm bringing to the table and what I'm doing is, is consistent, and I know that I'm trying to and doing my best to be better every day, and my daughter sees that, and that's probably the most important, and my most important person in my life. If she can see that and know that, daddy never gave up. Daddy's always going to keep pushing, no matter what he sees, no matter what struggles he may face. He keeps pushing. And, he, and, and I instill that in her. Don't ever give up on anything. Just keep pushing. You can do whatever you put your mind to. That's success to me. Just keep going. You know, you, you, never, put, you never reach a full height of success. You can always do better. Whether you, get a, whether you become a millionaire, you can become a billionaire. You know what I'm saying? There's always more to ascertain. It's never, it's never being content with what you have. You can always get more. And not necessarily, fi- you know, financially. It's mentally, emotionally, you know what I'm saying? It's not just about your pockets. It's about being fulfilled mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. 
Perfect. Perfect way to sum all that up. Thank you for that. So now before we do wrap things up, I do got a few uh, fun questions for you uh, just to kind of, you know, get your perspective, allows the audience to know a little bit more about you. So uh, this has been a fun one that we've been putting out there. So out of all these four foods, if you had to give up one of these for life, uh, which one would it be out of potatoes, bread, pasta or rice? Probably rice, because I eat rice the least out of all of that. Okay, so I, could, I could could probably give give rice up. Okay, easily. okay, easily, easily. Everything else has to be on the table. No, it doesn't. I think the one thing that has to be on the table is potatoes. Everything else is like hit or miss. You know, if I eat a sandwich, of course, I need bread for the most part, but pasta and rice. I don't really eat a lot of pasta and rice, but I mess with potatoes. I'm a, I'm a meat and potatoes guy. Mm. I like vegetables, but I'm a steak and I'm a steak and potato guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> potatoes. I feel like is the one that one that nobody wants to give up. <laughs> it's like and it's it's I, one of the most versatile things you can use because mm. it can do so many. It's like chicken. You can do it so many different ways. Like it's ridiculous. There you go. There you go. All right. Now, uh, uh, top three memes right now. Right now, man. Right I, now, <laughs> I, I, I've been on social media for the most part, so I don't really see a lot of memes. The thinking dude meme when he, when he, you know, mm-hmm. that that was my favorite one. Um, what else? The Elmo shrug meme. That, mm-hmm. that, that's, that's, I use that one. I don't care about a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, man, I can't think of a third one. What you got? What you got for yours? Oh man. See, no one's ever flipped it back, so <laughs> I never have an answer. Um, let's see, favorite ones right now. Um, or even if I could go back all the time, the Arthur Fist, I feel like that one. Oh, yeah. Like, okay. That, that okay. was a staple. Yeah, <laughs> the definitely. Arthur Fist. Um, definitely. Man, there's this one of this, uh, uh, this little black kid. He's like leaning back and he's like this. He's like singing something. And everybody was like, um, you know, what is he singing? And he's like singing passionately. And so people were kind of captioned with different songs or whatever. Cause he's, Was it he's, the one in the car? No, he's standing outside and he's like just leaning back and he's like, <laughs> he's holding <laughs> some note. Uh, but I used, to, I used to like throw some T-Pain songs over that. <laughs> oh, okay. Wait, I, I thought of my third one. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the one with the, with the black kid with the yellow shirt. And he's standing there with his with his cup or something. And, cu- <laughs> and he's doing doing the side eye, like, man, what is you doing? You're right. That one. That's the third one. Look at to the side, look at that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there that's you go. the one. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Now, you know, with all the, the cooking experience that you had and you maybe even shows that you've seen, what's your favorite cooking show? Man, Hell's Kitchen, hands down. Um, you know, I applied for Hell's Kitchen season six, never got a response back. Uh I actually got an email back for Chopped. But that was around the same time I messed up my knee in 2017. So um, I'm actually heavily considering reapplying for Hell's Kitchen next next season. Mm. So look out for that one. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let us let us know if you uh, if yeah, you know how far you get. If you get if you got an audition tape that you can just kind of <laughs> put out there. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll promote that. <laughs> Definitely, I appreciate that. Yeah, and then and then finally. You know, we 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 go through so many different movies. You know, there are so many cult classics in our culture. Um, what would you say is the number one timeless black movie in your opinion? Man, you can't you can't put that on me, but <laughs> I mean, I gotta go with Coming to America, man. I that 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 movie holds so much in my heart because when I was a kid and every every week I would, my mother would take me to the barber shop. I would ask the owner of the barbershop to put on coming to America and he would do it. He would stop everything else that was on and put that on for me. And I, I, I mean, the, the way in the barbershop, you know, that's when we had to sit in the barbershop and wait forever. Mm. So my barbershop wait was like two, three hours. Put that on. I'm good. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and get my hair cut and I'm done. Like I'm straight. Like, You're right. But that, that is my, that's my movie, man. Coming to America. I can watch it anytime it come on and still laugh. Yeah. Yeah. That's man. It, even when when the second one came out and i know there was like mixed reviews with that um there there was always the the people who did like parts of the movie they were always brought back to that first one and there's just so many moments that you can't 
really recreate, you can just kind of bring up and just really celebrate that. Yeah. Um, and probably one of the first movies that you probably see where, where there's black excellence in the beginning of the movie, if you think about it. That's fair. That's fair. I, I, I agree with that. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, so. I can't think of you're right. I can't think of no other movie before that that had that. That's right. Yeah. Because, <laughs> yeah, even think of a BET movie, it's always like, well, you're wondering how I got here. <laughs> <laughs> Get chased my by name, a dog my, or something. Look, my, my name is Jerome. I bet you I wonder how I got to this point in my day. Let me take y'all back to see. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Opening credits. Let's go. <laughs> Oh man, well, well, Marquise, that's all I got for you. Thank you for your time. Um, you know, you know, for for the listeners, this is my line brother uh, for Iota Phi Theta Fraternity Incorporated. So definitely a special guest uh, for me personally. So I appreciate you sharing your experience and everything. Any last words that you want to give to our audience? Man, I thank you for having me. Man, this was this was fun. Um, I ain't talked to you in a while or seen your face, so I appreciate that. <laughs> We got to definitely Zoom or FaceTime or something more just to, uh, we the closest to each other. We the only two we got that's closest to each other. So yeah, yeah. Definitely. And we got kids, so we definitely got to make something happen. So when you had a party, you want to shoot an invite to Zora, I'll gladly break her down there, man. No oh, problem. for sure, for sure, for sure. All right, man. Well, well, thank you again for your time and being a guest. And thanks to everybody who is listening. Uh, be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe to the podcast. Also, we're on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. That's at Inquire Hire, and we have inquirehire.com. We've got a lot of great resources there for student success. So until next time, peace. Thank you for that. Appreciate it.